good to be back here with you this evening. It's good to have the Rouse here with us. It's always good to have visitors with us, even if they are our friends or they're not really visitors, so to speak. But we're glad they're here with us and hope they're enjoying their, uh, their staycation, as we call it sometimes. Uh, Lisa and I were able to uh, be in Lee Summit, Missouri, uh, Friday and Saturday, and of course this morning uh, for a youth rally. And so we're thankful to be able to be a part of that. And there's between about 80 and 90 attendants. So we went, uh, we had a lot of good lessons, and so we're thankful that uh, that went well, and we were encouraged uh, by that. Our lesson this evening comes from Ezekiel, beginning really not really looking at uh, the, chap the book uh, chapter by chapter, even verse by verse, but looking at really receiving from chapters 2 and 3, looking at how Ezekiel is sent, sent to preach, beginning in chapters 2 and 3. It's interesting you notice in chapter 2, if you know much about Ezekiel, you'll find in chapter 2 of Ezekiel, you'll find the phrase or something similar to it, of how they were a rebellious people, or they were a rebellious house, and how Ezekiel was sent to them, and many times he is told he's going to be sent to them, they will not hear you because they're a rebellious house, they have that phrase put in there, over and over again, in fact, about eight times in chapter 2 of Ezekiel. So the picture is pretty clear. They are a rebellious people. They were those who are not willing to listen to the message that Ezekiel is bringing from God. We know that Ezekiel, uh, as we find in chapter 2, the Bible talks about here in chapter 2 how the, the Spirit would enter him. In chapter 2, verse 1, the Bible says, So when I saw it, I fell on my face. I mean, that's chapter 1. Chapter 2, and he said to me, uh, Son of man, stand on your feet, and I will speak to you. And the Spirit entered me when he spoke to me, verse 2, and set me on my feet, and I heard him who spoke to me. That's Ezekiel 2 and verse 2. And so we find there that the Holy, the Holy Spirit had entered Ezekiel to give Ezekiel the message in which he was to speak to the people. We find in verse 3 of Ezekiel uh, chapter 2 that he is sent to a rebellious people. The Bible says, He said to me, Son of man, I am sending you to the children of Israel. To a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me, they and their fathers have transgressed against me to this very day. Now what we find here is very clear that these individuals were not pleasing in the sight of God. As I said before, you find about eight times just in chapter 2 you know, they were they are called a rebellious people or a rebellious nation. You find it here in verse 3, and that is who Ezekiel is being sent to. You know, in your job, no matter what job you're in, there's always going to become a time where someone's going to give you an assignment that you know is not going to be easy. Especially if you have to deal with a lot of people. You know, it's one thing to be told that you'll sit down to, you know, work on a project that no one else can be around. But when you go or essentially work on a project or to do an assignment that involves people you have to work with directly, and you know that when you get there, they're not going to really be happy about it. And we know how we feel about that. Because you don't look forward to it, right? Because people aren't going to be happy to see you. Ezekiel is told in verse 3, they're not going to be happy to see you. They're not going to listen to you there in verse 3. He says in verse 4, most many of this will not be on the screen, but in verse 4, he says here, for they are impudent and stubborn children. I am sending you to them, and you shall say to them, thus says the Lord God. He doesn't even get into all things that the Lord's going to tell him. But we find in verse 4, he says again, these are stubborn people. They have sinned against God bravely. We're reminded of the same idea in Jeremiah chapter 3, how they, these people have sinned against God. The rebellious are always those who are, they have sinned against God. And it was because of, this, because of their sin that they were in exile. We find back in 2 Kings 17. The goal of, of Ezekiel being sent is to warn, but not to make them listen, because we know much about people. We can't make people do anything. How many times have we gone and talked to someone and tried to encourage them or tried to even have a Bible study with someone, and we realize and we remind you, you can't make anyone do anything. It'd be nice to be able to sit down and read the Bible with someone and then just say, aha, I get it, and obey and not have to keep on trying to explain it to them and get them to help them understand they need to act and not be so re not rebelled against the truth of God's word. And that's what we find here in verse 4 and 5. He says, For there are impudent and suffering children, I'm sending you to them. You shall say to them, Thus said the Lord God. And he says, Verse 5, and thus says, He changes 
signs here. It says, as for them, whether they hear or whether they refuse. What he's telling him, him is that when you go, it doesn't matter, you know, it's not your fault if they do not listen. You go and speak to them, whether they hear it, of course, great, right? But even if they refuse, you keep on sending out that message. He says, whether they hear it or whether they refuse, for they are a rebellious house, yet they will know that a prophet has been among them. What is he talking about? So he's saying whether they listen to you or not, they're going to know that you are a prophet from God that has come among them to speak and give them that word. And if they do not obey, it's not Ezekiel's fault. Is it? Instead, he warns them time and time again. And we find it emphasized in chapter 2 and chapter 3 that he is sent to them. Later, he's referred to actually as a watchman who's going to watch over them and try to get them to come back to God. We look at verse 7 in the same chapter. He says, You shall speak my words to them, whether they hear or whether they, or whether they refuse, or they are rebellious. Again, there's that phrase again, whether they are rebellious. But uh, the idea there is very clear. Whether they obey or do not obey, what is he to do? The Bible says in verse 7, You shall speak my words to them, even if they will listen or even if they will not. For they are a rebellious people. We know that his commission, as we call it sometimes, is similar to that of Isaiah, as we find in Isaiah chapter 6. We also realize that the, those who refuse to obey God, their unbelief, as we find in Romans chapter 3, yes, that unbelief saddens God. It goes against God's will. But even God will not make an individual obey him. You think about when Saul met Christ on the road to the Damascus there in the book of Acts. How when he saw the glory of Christ was blinded by him. Christ did not make him believe. He just simply revealed to him who he was. So I could have said, well, you know what? I don't care who you are. I'm not going to listen to you anyway. But that's not what happened. He wasn't made to believe. We know those who had obeyed the gospel in Acts chapter 2 were not made to believe. They were told what they had done. They were told what's going to happen. For that reason, in verse 37, Acts 2, they asked the question, Your brother, what shall we do? He doesn't say, You're all going to be saved, no matter what you think, no matter if you like your not, he doesn't say that. He says, so Tell us what they have to do if they want, if they desire to be saved. We think about the words of Ezekiel. In Ezekiel chapter 2, backing up just one verse in verse 6, he is told that these individuals would have, quote, singing words. To stay against them. He says, And you, son of man, do not be afraid of them, nor be afraid of their words, though briars and thorns are with you, and you dwell among scorpions. What's he talking about? He's not saying you're going to be living out in the bushes somewhere, that you're going to have to fight through all the bushes to get to these people. He's not saying you're going to deal with literal scorpions. What he's saying is, these bushes, these thorns, these briars, these scorpions, he's describing the people he's talking to. They are what? You ever hear someone say, well, they're a little bit prickly sometimes? They're a little bit offensive, they're a little bit rude. We're honest, we all can be that way sometimes, right? But here he's talking about these people who he's used to be sent to. And he says, they are what? Though the briars and thorns are with you, that's how he's describing the people, right? And you dwell among scorpions, talking again about these people. Not a good way to describe them. He says, he goes on again to remind him why he's telling him this. He says, do not be afraid of their words or dismayed by their looks, though they are a rebellious house. There it is again, a rebellious house. He's saying you're going to say things against you that's going to sting. If you ever talk to any Bible class, or let's be honest, if you ever try to talk to anyone about the Bible, sometimes we will have some stinging words to reply when you talk to them a little bit. People get very upset sometimes when you just sometimes when you go read the Bible to them or what the case may be, talking with them, trying to encourage them to consider some things. They can have some very stinging and very hurtful words, and that's what the Lord is reminding Ezekiel of here in verse 6. As he calls them briars and thorns and scorpions. We also talk about here in verse 6 how it's not just the words, but the look on their faces. He says, Do not be dismayed 
by their looks. If he's asking him not to be dis dismayed by their looks, you think they were smiling at Ezekiel? <coughs> or maybe they were looking at him thinking, wait till nobody else is around. You know, they were no doubt, as we find here again, they called rebellious house for a reason because they were not going to listen. The wicked here again are referred to as briars and thorns. They are painful. They are not kind, to say the least. We think about Ezekiel's education in the sense of what is it he's going to be speaking. He's given a mission, but he's when you are sent on a mission to do something, you have to have you have to be going there for a reason, right? When people go overseas to do mission work, and when we're doing mission work, there's always a reason behind it. You have to just go to meet and greet people. No, they go to teach the gospel. They go to preach the lost. We find Ezekiel chapter 2, looking at verse 8. He says here, But you, son of man, hear what I say to you. Do not be rebellious like a rebellious house. Open your mouth and eat what I give you. What he's saying here in verse 8 is, You're going to speak to them. You're going to speak my words to them, right? Ezekiel was told to listen carefully, wasn't he? He says here, do not be rebellious like that rebellious, rebellious house, saying, I'm going to give you my words, and don't rebel against me. How did Ezekiel rebel against God? He could have softened the message, could he? He could have blended in some half-truths, or as one preacher said, he could have been one of those who just thought some truth and all of it. But we think here in verse 8, what does he tell Ezekiel? But you, son of man, hear what I, and this God, say to you. Do not be rebellious like that rebellious house. Do not be like them, but listen to him, unlike everybody else has been doing. He says, open your mouth and eat what I give you. That is, if you find in chapter 3 and verse 10, what is it? He says here in verse 10, Moreover, he said to me, son of man, receive into your heart all my words. I speak to you and hear with your ears. We know that we get, continue reading here in verse 9 in just a moment. He has given something to eat. And it's a scroll representing God's word. You must listen carefully. What is he given to eat? As we see here back, back in verse 8, says, open your mouth to eat what I give you. What is he going to be given to eat? God's word, beginning in verse 9 of the same chapter. If you go to verse 9, when I looked, there was a hand stretched, stretched out to me. And behold, a scroll of a book was in it. Then he spread it before me, and there was writing on the inside and the outside, and on it were, were limitations and mourning and woe. Verse 1 of chapter 3 says, Moreover, he said to me, Son of man, eat what you find, eat this scroll, and go and speak to the house of Israel. What is he talking about? And saying, I'm going to feed you with my word, you're going to go and speak my words to that people. These are the words. I'm going to fill you up with my words, and that's what you're going to speak. Look at verse 2. So I opened my mouth, and he caused me to eat, that, to eat that scroll. And he said to me, Son of man, feed your belly and fill your stomach with this scroll that I give you. So I ate it. It was in my mouth like honey and sweetness. Now, it was sweet to Ezekiel. I think most likely most fitting response to that reason why is because Ezekiel wanted him was right. So it was sweet to him. You know, those who love the Word of God, when they hear the Bible being preached, or hear a Bible class being taught in a biblical manner, they're not those who are scowling, they're those who are smiling and nodding along. And so that word he's given there in verse 3, he says, it, it was in his mouth like honey and sweetness. But to those he was going to, was it was going to be like honey and sweetness? You know, it was going to be like bitter and gross and disgustingness because they would not want to hear it. They did not want to hear it. Ezekiel's duty was, was for him to go and to preach and to teach these people. It was to be the one who had this word given to him, was to fill his belly, and that's what he was to preach and to teach. But his duty also included being a watchman. Included being a watchman. We look here with me, if you will, in Ezekiel chapter 3, beginning in verse 16. And instead, we're not looking at every single verse, but we get in chapter 3, looking at verse 16, what the Bible tells us. Now it came to pass at the end of seven days, and the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore, hear a word from my mouth, and give them warning from me. What is he to do? <clears throat> to warn the people. A watchman looks out for a group of people. It could be a city, 
It could be a village. It could be, as we find here, it's, it's Israel, right? It's a nation. Well, he wasn't just to go and warn them about what he thought they were doing wrong. He was to go and warn them about what God had proclaimed they had been doing wrong. What they've been doing wrong has been, been rebellious against God. He says in verse 17, There is some man, the Lord speaking to Ezekiel, Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. You're going to look after them. You're going to do what? You're going to warn them with the words that I give you. There in verse 17. Hear what? A word from my mouth. That's what Ezekiel is speaking. They weren't his own words or his own opinions or what he thought was right. It was God's warning. He says, and give them warning, tell us through verse 17, from me. Ezekiel didn't barge in and start telling them everything they were doing wrong. He came upon them with the word from God, telling them they need to make themselves right. Verse 18 says, And I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give him no warning, nor speak to warn them, nor speak to warn the wicked from his, from his wicked way to save his life. And the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. What is he saying? Unless you want their blood in your hands, you need to warn them, right? You need to warn them. If they die in sin and you need to warn them, he says, His blood I will require at your hand. Look with me at verse 19. Yet if, if you warn the wicked, and he does not turn from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, you think God thought he was living wickedly? Wickedness, wicked way, pretty clear, right? He shall die in iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. Why? Because you have warned him. We hear people today talk about all those who may have called baptized, and sometimes I hear a large number. I can't help that I'm a little skeptical. Because we realize like sometimes it's easy to get people to get in the bathtub or near rivers to get in water. It's a lot more difficult to get them to actually obey the truth to get there in a sincere and actually understanding why they're there in the first place. We're not those who are sent to preach and teach just to get people away. We're those who are sent to preach and to teach to get people to actually obey with understanding. So when they are immersed, they are immersed in the mission of their sins, not simply to appease those who are trying to teach them. We find in verse 19, it says, If you warn the wicked... And he does not turn from his and he does not turn from his wickedness nor from his wicked way. He shall die in his iniquity. His sin is not blotted out. But instead, he says in verse 19, but you, because he has warned him, he said that you have delivered your soul. We want to be those who warn others. We want to be those who reach out to the lost and warn them of their sinful ways. So the day of judgment, we don't answer saying, Well, we never warned them. Look with me, if you will, in Isaiah chapter 62, and verse 6. The Bible says, As the watchmen on your walls, O Jerusalem, they shall never hold their peace day or night. You who make mention of the Lord, do not keep silent. His purpose is to bring warning. You cannot convert those who will not be converted. You cannot save those who will not be saved. We all have probably sit down with those who we wish would obey but will not, those who may perhaps have been studied with for a long period of time, and yet they have not obeyed the gospel. And no doubt those things can be very difficult, they can be very disappointing, they can be very hurtful, especially depending on who you're talking to. But we cannot say those who will not obey. And Ezekiel is a good reminder of that. Yes, he wants them to be saved. Does God want them to turn in their sinful way? Absolutely, that's why Ezekiel is sin. But Ezekiel has sent the message, you go and warn them, they're, going to not, they're not going to like it, they're going to say hurtful things to you, they're going to have some very crude and mean faces perhaps towards you, and they may not obey, but you go and you preach and you teach anyway. He says there in, verse, in Isaiah 62 and verse 6, I have set a watchman on your walls of Jerusalem, they shall never hold their peace day or night, you who make mention of the Lord, do not keep silent. They were doing what? They were watching out for the people. We want to be those who watch out for one another. God's word was sent to warn. And this won't be on the screen. If you look at Psalm 1, let's look at Psalm 19. Look at Psalm 19, verse 11. Here the Bible says, Moreover, Bobby, your servant is warned 
and keeping them, there is great reward. Ezekiel was sent to warn the people, wasn't he? We saw back there in Ezekiel chapter 2 and chapter 3 that he was sent to them with God's word, not with his word, with God's word. And he was to warn them. And we look here in Psalm 19, verse 11, what the psalmist tell us? He says here, Moreover, by them, that is by what? By your word. And as we look there in verse 10, he says, What is more to be desired than gold and, and fine gold, what's sweeter than honey and the honeycomb, the word of God, God's commandments? Psalm 19, verse 10. Verse 11, he says, Moreover, by them, by God's commandments, he says, Your servant is warned. The Bible is filled with warnings from Genesis to Revelation. You think about it, one of the first things that God spoke to Adam was a warning, wasn't it? One of the first things he spoke to Adam and Eve together was a warning. Stay away from a certain tree, right? That was a warning. The Bible is filled with warnings. We get all the way to the end of our Bible today, as we call it again, Revelation, right? And we find the first three chapters, what does Christ do through John? He warns churches there in Asia, right? He warns them using phrases such as, repent or I will come quickly, live your candlestick, right? That's a warning, right? He warns, numerous, he warns them over and over again. We find throughout the Bible, warnings after warnings after warnings, but never once we find anyone who is forced to turn to God in obedience by force, not one single time. Instead, we find over and over again how God's messengers are warned about those who be against them, about those who would do hurtful things to them. We think about, we talked about here recently, Jeremiah, and how he was ridiculed and, and, and punished and put in stocks and hated by numerous people. Jeremiah 20 bears that out. And he talks about all these acquaintances. Watch for him just to mess up. And here in Ezekiel chapter 2 and chapter 3, he is warned by God to not be afraid of them, of their words, or by their faces. But yet we are reminded here in Psalm 19, verse 11. By them your servant is warned. I notice this, the last part of verse 11. And in keeping them, there is great reward. In keeping them, there is great reward. Doesn't Ezekiel, or didn't God, of course, want those people to turn to him so they can enjoy the rewards of obedience? When we think about the rewards of obedience, there's numerous rewards, different aspects of obedience we could, uh, of, of rewards we look at. We talk about the, the fellowship and joy of brothers and sisters in Christ. We talk about the gloriousness of the church we get to be a part of here on earth. When we move forward, we talk also, of course, about salvation, having our sins remitted, being made right inside of God. Those are all part of the rewards of obedience, but also paradise and then one day heaven. As part of the Christian's reward. You know, think about that word paradise. Why does God use that word paradise to describe such a place? It's not because it's terrible. I never heard someone say, well, it's paradise, and get there, it's terrible. And they said, well, that's what I can have you describe it's paradise. No, it's not. Paradise is a place of rest, a place of comfort, a place of enjoyment, even. And that's probably more than the gift of being faithful to God. We are messengers for God today. We are to warn people today, still to warn people today. We think about Ezekiel. He was sent to Israel, right? He was sent to those people to warn them of their sin. Today, are we any different when we talk to people about God? Why don't we talk to people about God in the first place? It's much more than just to get them to come and visit with us, right? It's because judgment day is coming. You know, even during the time period of Ezekiel, he knew that ultimately one day the judgment day was going to come, and where are these types of people are going to appear. That's why he was there to warn them. Today, when we talk to people about God and about the church and about the Bible in general, one of the reasons we do that is to warn them about the price of sin and to remind them of the rewards of obedience. Think about this for a second. Which one is easier to, to warn people of the price of sin or to remind them of the rewards of obedience? Rewards are a lot more, a lot more enjoyable to talk about, right? <clears throat> rewards, I mean, everybody wants a reward for something. Well, 
in order to receive the reward that God has promised, sometimes we have to be warned to get back to make ourselves right with God again. Again, we go back to Ezekiel chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. He calls them what? He says, They are his stubborn children. And that's what he's being sent to. He says in verse 5, As for them, whether they hear or whether they refuse, for they are a rebellious house, yet yeah, they will know that the prophet has been among them. You know, whether people obey when we talk to them about God, whether people obey when we have a Bible with them, you know, sometimes we think when we study with someone, they should obey just after the very first study. That rarely happens. But that's what we want, right? We want that, we want that surety. They're going to obey and be right and be okay to sight of God. <coughs> but we're reminded of over and over again in Ezekiel is that that's not always the case. And we have to prepare ourselves for that. You think about all the prophets and many times they went in to preach and teach and the situations they were in. We think about the difficult situations we go into sometimes. We go visit someone who has been coming. We haven't seen them in a while. We sit down with them. And we know this could go very, very badly. And at least in the sense that they're not going to listen to anything you have to say. Right? We have the pleasantries, but the weather, blah, blah, blah. I think it's okay. We need to talk about some things. And so sometimes just that phrase, you lose them, right? And so we go and play, go in that house, this situation, at least to some degree prepared, knowing that this may not change anything. And when Ezekiel, that's what God is warning him. You may you go in there and you preach and teach the truth. God doesn't even test the mystery. He's being, being realistic. They may not listen to Ezekiel. They may not like what you say. They may, not, uh, they may reply with hurtful comments. They may attack you. But you go anyway. That's what Ezekiel was to do. Today, as Christians, we think about how to apply this today. We are to do exactly the same thing. We are to reach out to those around us, regardless, regardless of not we believe they're going to obey or not. You know, that was part of Jonah's problem, wasn't it? When he said to Nineveh, we find him after he went to Nineveh, finally, that word we do, he still complained about him, right? He said, they'll never do what's right, God. Why are you wasting your time? I'm paraphrasing, obviously. But that was his gist of the idea. They're going to do what is right. But we still go anyway, right? Regardless of Jonah thought they're going to listen or not, he wants to go. Ezekiel is warned right ahead, right ahead of time. Whether they listen or not, you go. We are successful when we go with the truth. Yes, of course, we want people to obey. Yes, of course, we want people to do what is right. We have to be prepared mentally there's going to be those who will not. There's going to be those who will not like your, what you're doing, what you're trying to do, and they're not going to listen to anything you have to say. And that's what God's preparing Ezekiel for. We also think about this, we're going to be messengers for God today, and we are also to serve as watchmen for the church, which means we look, we look out for one another. It doesn't mean we are the policemen of everyone else's business. But we find those who are not coming as they should. Because let's be honest, that's the first sign many times of those who are departing from the faith is to stop seeing them. Right? We go, we go and visit with them. We know it kind of progresses from there, right? But what are we to do as watching them? Are to go and we are to warn them? In love, not in bitterness or in anger or in accusations, we are going to warn them, right? When Ezekiel went, he didn't go and say, well, I have these accusations against you. What he did, he went and warned them, reminded them, this is a message from God, and here it is. Come back to me, right? Come back to God and his word. We are to serve as watchmen for the church in the sense we are to look out for one another. We are to be those who make sure that we do all we can, make sure not only we go to heaven, but those who are with us get to go as well. Because they're obedient to God and his word. You know, we think about today sometimes that we think we're going into a difficult situation. There's not a prophet that ever existed who didn't go into a difficult situation. Right? I mean, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Daniel, Ezekiel, the thing about Moses, Abraham, all those guys, all the things they did. We think about Ruth and Esther, those situations they, they found themselves in. People of God have always found themselves 
in difficult situations because you want to do what is right and what is true and what is what will please God, and everybody's going to like it. So we think about this this evening. We think about that phrase you find in Ezekiel chapter 3 about how there are those who are going to reject you, they're going to refuse. But very clearly, in, first, in, these, in these chapters here, chapter 2 and 3, the message is clear. Regardless of they hear or they do not hear, we must reach out those around us anyway. You know, it's, it's very tempting sometimes when things are not going as we would like them to go or as we would think they should go, especially when somebody reaching out to the lost. It's tempting for us to say, well, maybe we should stop for a little while, right? You know, I think about our food pantry and, and how it's dwindled in numbers, and I think it does all the things that's what we've done. When we teach a Bible class and we offer food, I don't know how you can be anything wrong with that. But yeah, we, we have some problems with those who come with that. And that can be discouraging, though, at times. But you know, I think about Ezekiel and what God's message was to him. But they hear or not hear, teach them anyway. And that's your reaction as well. We should allow ourselves to become disheartened by those around us who will not listen, those who refuse to obey, and let's instead remember the words that God gave to Ezekiel. They may refuse, they may rebel, but he also said first, if they hear, which tells us there's always a chance of those who will listen to our words. This evening, as you think about these things, you think about what Ezekiel faced and what we face today, we need to maybe reevaluate our own efforts and we allow ourselves to change our mindset towards reaching out to those around us. We make those changes, and then we, if we need to make those changes, then let's do so. But we need to ask you to ask for prayers, for words of encouragement. We're glad to assist you. Let's get we stand and sing the song has been selected. I want to be a silver for Jesus' hand.